<clears throat> this is lecture four. And we're covering section 1.4, which is about prime numbers, unique factorization, and finite fields. And the most important thing is to know about prime numbers. So a prime number is an integer. So let's say an integer p is prime. If first p is at least two, so p is not only positive, but one is not a prime. And if the only positive divisors, positive integral divisors of p are one and p. So two is prime. The only integers, positive integers that divide two are one and two. Three is prime. Four is not prime because two divides four. This vertical line is our symbol for dividing. Two divides four. Another name for a number that is not prime is composite. So a composite number is a number of these two, which is not prime. So four is composite. Five is prime. Six is not prime. Because, for example, two divides six and three divides six. Seven is prime. Eight is not prime. Eight is composite. Because in addition to one and eight, two divides eight and four divides eight and so forth. And it's a useful exercise to go through the integers starting with two and find those that are prime and those that are not prime. If you start making a list of integers that are prime, the only even number that's prime is two. Every other number has to be odd. Three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, After 23, the next prime is 29, 31, 37, 41. It's fun making a list of primes. They're very nice numbers. They're very important numbers. And they are practical in the sense that a huge amount of, in our case, cryptography is based on prime numbers. And a prime number has the following important attribute, important property. This is sometimes called Euclid's lemma because it was known to Euclid. So in the text, this is proposition 119, but Euclid's lemma, so don't think this is modern mathematics. This is well over 2,000 years old. So Euclid's lemma has two forms. So the first form is that if a prime, so P is prime. If a prime P divides a product A times B, then in fact, P divides A or P divides B or both. And note, this is not true necessarily if P is composite. So for example, suppose you let A equal four and B equal nine, then Six divides four times nine, which is 36, but six 
does not divide four and six does not divide nine. So six divides this product of two numbers, but it does not divide either factor. And that's because six is not prime. So Euclid's lemma is true about primes, but it's not always true for other numbers. So how do we prove Euclid's lemma? Suppose we let G be the greatest common divisor of A and P. So G divides A and G divides P. So if G divides P, then, well, the only positive divisors of a prime are one and P. So either G equals one or G equals P. If G equals P, we're done because G divides A, G is a common divisor of A and P, and if G is equal to P, P divides A. So in the case that G equals P, we're done. So suppose that G is one, that is the greatest common divisor of A and P is one. So by the Euclidean algorithm, there are integers u and v such that what? We can write the greatest common divisor of two numbers as an integral linear combination of them. So au plus pv equals one. But what was our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that p divides ab. So a, b is p times c for some integer c. So let's multiply this equation by b. a, u plus p, v equals one. So a, b, u plus p, b, v equals b. I just multiplied by b. But for a, b, I can substitute p, c. So p, c, u plus P, P, V equals B, P, B, V. If I factor out the P, I see that P times C, U plus B, V equals B. In other words, P divides B. B is P times something. So we're done. That's the proof. And it only takes a paragraph here and in the book but you need to spend a lot of time studying this proof. Okay. You need to spend a lot of time studying the proof. And the more general statement is the following. The more general statement is if P divides a product of n integers, then P divides one of them, at least. P divides a i for some i. And the proof would go like this. P divides this product a1, a2, up to a sub n. But we can think of this as the product of a1 with a2 up to an. So by the statement we just proved, if p divides the product of two numbers, either p divides the first or p divides the second, which is a2 up to an. And if p divides a2 up to an, then p divides a2 or p divides a3 up to an. And continuing in this way, we see that P has, this process has to stop because at every step, we have one fewer factor here. So at some point, we have an integer AI where P divides AI. And this is really all we need to prove 
what is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Fundamental theorem says the following. Take an integer a, at least two, then a can be written as a product of prime numbers, not distinct uh, prime numbers to powers. P1 to the E1, P2 to the E2, P sub R to the E sub R, where P1 up to PR are primes, and the exponents are positive integers. So for example, if you let A be equal to 360, you can factor that. Let me do it in a couple of steps. This is, for example, 36 times 10. 36 is 6 times 6, and 10 is 2 times 5. 6 is 2 times 3. 6 is 2 times 3. 2 times 5. I have three twos, two cubed. I have two threes, three squared, and one five or five to the first power. So this is the representation of 360 as a product of powers of prime numbers. And any integer that you write down can be factored into a product of primes. Now, your computer, for example, if you learn to use Maple, Maple has a command I factor, which will factor an integer with maybe up to 10 or 12 or 15 digits. It's very quick. If you take a really big integer, an integer, let's say, with 100,000 digits, computer is not going to be able to factor it. This is sort of a very unusual, especially simple form. So how do we prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? So suppose you take a number A. First of all, so we'll do it in two steps. A is a product of primes. And the second step will say uniquely. That you, other than rearranging the factors, like it doesn't count to say six is two times three and also three times two. In both factorizations of six, the prime two occurs once and the prime three occurs once. But this is the same factorization. So uniquely means up to rearranging the factors. So if you take a number A, the two possibilities, if it's prime, we're done. And if it's not prime, that means if it's composite, then you can write A as A1 times A2, where A1 and A2 are proper factors. They're less than A and bigger than one. And take A1, if it's not a prime, factor it. Take A2, if it's not a prime, factor it. As you do this, you get smaller and smaller numbers, but they're positive integers. They can't go, they can't decrease forever. At some point you hit one or zero. So this process of just continuing, continuing factoring will always write an integer as a product of primes. The harder part is to show that this is unique. So suppose P1 up to P sub S are primes and Q1 up to Q sub T are primes. And the number A is a product of P1 P2 up to P sub S, but also a product of Q1 up to Q sub T, where uh, we don't even assume 
that S is equal to T. In the, at the beginning, we don't have to assume you have the same number of prime factors. Suppose A is a product of S prime factors, and it's also a product of T prime factors. What I want to show is that they have the same number of prime factors and the same number of primes. So if you look at this, P1 divides A, plus A is P1 times something, which means P1 divides Q1, Q2 up to Q sub T. But by Euclid's lemma, this means P1 divides Q sub I for some I. We prove that if a prime divides a product of integers, it must divide one of them, at least one of them. So P1 divides some QI, but QI is a prime. It's only divisors are one of it and itself. P is a prime, so it's not one. So P1 equals QI. So in fact, the prime P1 is one of these factors over here. If I renumber them, I can suppose that P1 is Q1. So then I can factor P1 and I get that P2 up to P sub S is Q2 up to Q sub S. And then we continue this argument, P2 divides this product. So it's one of the factors, say it's Q2. So you might have P2 equals Q2 and P3 up to PS equals Q3 up to QS, up to QT. And continuing in this way, P3 is one of these factors and so forth, we get in the end, the same number of primes and in fact, the same primes. So it's easy to say this and you can actually write it down in just a couple of lines as it's done in the textbook. But again, this is something that takes I would say hours of study to understand. So every number is a product of primes. 1728 turns out to be two to the six times three cubed. And in general, if a number n is p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, and so forth, um, p sub r to the e sub r, we define the function Ord P of A. Ord P of A is the power of P, the highest power of P that divides A. So if I look at the number 1728, Ord 2 of 1728, the highest power of 2 that divides 1728 is 6. Or three of 728, the highest power of three that divides 1728 is three. Or five of 1728, well, five doesn't divide this. So you can think of this as times five to the zero, which is one. The highest power of five that divides 1728 is the zeroth power, just as the highest power of seven that divides 1728 is zero. So we have this useful function, ord p of a, which is a function from the positive integers to the non-negative integers. So by n, I mean one, the natural numbers, the positive integers. And by n zero, I mean the non-negative integers, zero along with the positive integers. So for any prime p and any positive integer a, ord p of a gives you some non-negative integer. It's zero if the prime doesn't divide a.
Now, when we were looking at congruences, given a modulus m and an integer a, there exists an integer b such that a times b is congruent to one mod m, if and only if the greatest common divisor of a and m is one. Now, if m equals p, a prime number, a, B is congruent to one mod P, there exists a B that satisfies this congruence, if and only if the greatest common divisor of A and P is one. That means P doesn't divide A. Now, if and only if A, is not congruent to zero mod p, or if and only if p does not divide a. So if you take a number a, which is relatively prime to p, there's always a b such that a b is congruent to one mod p. So if we look at Z mod PZ star, this is the set of all A, such that A and P are relatively prime. These are the congruence classes mod P. This is all the integers from one to P minus one. So C of P is P minus one where phi of p is the Euler phi function that we talked about in the last So in algebra, a field, examples of fields are, let's say, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers. And they're fields because you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide but only by a non-zero element. So these are infinite fields, all the fractions, all the real numbers, all the complex numbers. If we look at the congruence classes mod P, we're not including zero, everything here has an inverse. You can always solve A, B congruent to one mod P and Z mod PZ, the set of numbers that are congruent mod P, is a fourth example of a field. This is a finite field. It's only finite in many objects. In computer science, the simplest example is when P is equal to two, Z mod 2Z is just zero, one. Addition mod t. So this is a field, the binary field. Zero plus zero, zero plus one, one plus one, one plus one is zero. You can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. This is the simplest example of a finite field. And 
notation, sometimes for z mod pz, one writes f sub p to mean the field with p elements. Wow. So that took very little time. That's section 1.4, but there is a lot of meat in this section. And we have to understand this. There's one more section, 1.5, on primitive roots and finite fields that I will that will be in the next talk. That's section 1.5. And I'm going to add some problems. Uh, so the homework, the next homework due on uh, Monday will include some horror problems from this section as well. Um, but these four sections, 1.2, uh, 0.3, 0.4, and 0.5, contain a large part of the elementary number theory we need to construct codes. Um, and again, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to study the book and do the exercises and learn this material. That's it. <laughs>